Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, the first species of pterosaur from Japan has been named, another species of pterosaur from Germany has been discovered, some planets may form earlier than we thought, and more. Before we get into the news, be sure that you're subscribed to the new home of 7 Days of Science. We'll only be uploading these episodes to this channel for another two weeks, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss future episodes. Also, if you go over to the new channel now, you'll find an extended version of this episode that includes some extra stories, so be sure to go and watch that. Also, please do be sure to check out the link in the description to pre-order your very own scientifically accurate Spinosaurus plushie. We're calling him Swimbo and he's absolutely adorable, but we need your help to get him funded so he can actually be made. The details are on the site linked below. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the Astrophysical Journal has looked at data gathered by ALMA, a massive array of observational equipment in northern Chile, and made a surprising discovery about the formation of huge exoplanets. It's usually believed that these planetary bodies cannot form at the very very early days of a solar system because of the extreme conditions of the protostar's influence. ALMA observed eight protoplanetary disks over a thousand light years away, and they were much further along their formation than astronomers expected. It's the formation of these planets in the outer regions of these disks that is particularly surprising to scientists, as this has only really been previously observed in much less harsh environments. These observations therefore suggest that the processes behind planet formation are much more robust than perhaps we thought, suggesting that planets could be forming much more often than we believed. This could also be an impactful discovery when it comes to looking at how our own solar system formed, as it is believed that it was a similarly harsh environment in its early days. This could be an enormous discovery and will likely encourage further research into these harsher environments to see what else we can find. And just a quick news story from SpaceX, they had another Starship test yesterday which did not see quite as much success as their previous test. Last month SpaceX were able to actually catch their booster rocket back at the launch pad using the chopsticks that are part of the launch tower. SpaceX did say afterwards that the automated systems on the rocket very nearly cooled off the attempt and instead would have put the rocket down in the ocean or, in a more extreme scenario, had it self-destruct. SpaceX say safety for their employees and the public is a priority, so the automatic systems that can decide to cancel the attempted catch aren't very lenient. Well, yesterday's launch saw the rocket decide to abort an attempted catch and instead opted for a soft landing in the Gulf of Mexico. The upper stage tested a reignition of an engine early on and then landed in the Indian Ocean. While this is not as much of a spectacular success as the last test, it will no doubt bring a host of invaluable data to the SpaceX team to help them fine-tune Starship, ready for its planned use to return humans to the moon in 2026. Moving now to the paleontology news, obviously the most exciting thing that's happened this last week was the announcement of the mummified saber-toothed cat cub found frozen in ice in Siberia. This find is unbelievably incredible, and we couldn't wait a whole week to talk about it, so we made a 7 Days of Science special feature a few days ago in which Amelia covered many of the most exciting parts of this discovery, and what it means for our understanding of saber-toothed cats. So do be sure to go and watch that if you haven't already. Well, it's also been a very good week for pterosaur lovers, as we've got not one, but two new species of pterosaurs named in the last seven days of science. The first of these is a new species named from a fossil found in Japan. Now this is exciting for a few reasons, one of them being that this is the first ever pterosaur found in the country that's actually been named. One of the other very exciting aspects of the discovery is the fact that this is an Ashdarkid pterosaur, a member of the lineage including the biggest flying animals ever, such as the famous Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsigopteryx. It's been named Nipponopterus mifunensis, and it dates to sometime between 94 and 86 million years ago. It's represented by a single neck bone, specifically the sixth vertebra, and it was actually discovered a while ago. But it's only in recent years, after more has been learned about the anatomy of the Ashdarkids, thanks to various other fossil finds, that the paleontologists have been able to recognize which neck bone this is, as well as how the anatomy can tell us which other pterosaurs it's related to. Although it's somewhat incomplete, the distinct features of the neck bone show many similarities to the subgroup of Ashdarkids 
including Quetzalcoatlus. Specifically, Nipponopterus seems to be most closely related to an unnamed Ashdarkid found in Mongolia. Nipponopterus was a relatively small Ashdarkid compared to the enormous 10 meter wingspan giants of the group, with wings probably reaching three to three and a half meters across, although this individual probably wasn't fully grown yet. It's also now one of the oldest known named Ashdarkids, coming from quite early on in the time span of this lineage. The second new pterosaur species announced this last week is from Germany. This animal is significant because it represents an interesting transitional stage in pterosaur evolution. It's been named Scyphosaura bavarica, and it lived during the late Jurassic period around 149 million years ago. It's quite large for a pterosaur at this time, with a wingspan of 1.75 meters, and is represented by an almost complete but disarticulated specimen. Amazingly though, the bones are preserved in three dimensions. It's not super compressed, like a lot of other Jurassic pterosaurs from Germany tends to be. It's only missing bits of the skull, a few vertebrae, and some elements from the hands and feet. Scyphosaura adds another piece to the puzzle of a major pterosaur evolutionary transition. This transition marks the appearance of the more derived pterosaur grouping known as the pterodactyloids, the pterosaurs with short tails and generally of larger body size than the earlier grades of these flying reptiles. A few other transitional pterosaurs have been discovered in recent years that have heads and necks like pterodactyloids, but bodies more similar to the earlier forms. And now Scyphosaura provides another link between the transitional forms, including species such as Darwinopterus, and the pterodactyloids, showing that a few general trends and changes to the body plan can be observed. These include an increase in head size and neck length, and a reduction in tail length as the more derived forms appeared. So another fantastic new pterosaur species that tells us a great deal about these reptiles' evolution. Also in the recent news, researchers modeling Ice Age plankton responses to past climate change have found some worrying results. Fossilized calcifying zooplankton, known as foraminifera, have been the subject of a recent study into the effects of a warming ocean on the zooplankton seen in our seas today. Geological records show that during deglacial warming at the end of the last glacial maximum, plankton were able to relocate away from the warmer oceans to survive. Data from the microfossil record of these organisms were combined with a new computer model, which allowed analysis of how the plankton behaved 21,000 years ago during the last glaciation of the Ice Age with how they might act under future climate projections. Four future warming scenarios were simulated, a 1.5 degree, a 2 degree, a 3 degree, and a 4 degree Celsius rise in global warming by 2100 compared to the 1900 to 1950 average. The model predicts that by 2100, the global sea surface temperature will increase by 1, 1.3, 2.1, and 2.8 degrees Celsius respectively, and that even at the current rate of warming, ocean temperatures are increasing too rapidly for the foraminifera to adapt. This will have a devastating effect on the marine environment, influencing food webs and carbon storage in the ocean. The situation will be further exacerbated by such issues as ocean acidification and bleaching. Let's hope that the discussions taking place at COP29 lead to some real action on climate change. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Also, in case you've missed the announcements, be sure to subscribe to the new Seven Days of Science channel if you want to keep up to date with all the new science discoveries. Seven Days of Science will be moving there in the next couple of weeks and will no longer be uploaded on this channel. Links will be in the description. And also be sure to follow the new Seven Days of Science Instagram account too. Also again, be sure to pre-order your very own scientifically accurate Spinosaurus plushie. Swimbo is absolutely adorable and we really want to be able to get him made for people to be able to have their own ones. And be sure to check out the Curiosity Box and sign up for it using our link and use the code FOSSIL for some great discounts. You can watch the review video we did on the box in the recent Arachnids video. All right, see you next week.